This is Christy Drutman, and you are listening to Brown Girl Green, where I interview environmental leaders and advocates about diversity and inclusion, as well as creative solutions to the climate crisis. I'm working to change the image of what it means to be an environmentalist in the 21st century. I'm recording this podcast on Ohlone land, otherwise known as the Bay Area. This is your daily reminder that we are all living on stolen land. The Brown Girl Green podcast is supported by Earth Justice, a national legal nonprofit defending the planet and its people for nearly 50 years. Earth Justice has 150 full-time lawyers fighting in court for our planet's future and representing all clients free of charge. Until people come before profit, until all energy is clean, until the wild is truly free, and until justice stands for all, Earth Justice will never rest. Learn more at ejus.tc backslash bgg. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Brown Girl Green Show. My name is Christy Drutman, and I interview environmental leaders and advocates about diversity and inclusion, as well as creative solutions to the climate crisis. Today, we are talking all things food waste, but we're actually going to redefine it as talking about it as food surplus today. And I'm really excited for today's guest because he is an expert in all things food uh, and what to do with it, how to address it. You know, we have so much food in the world, and not all of it's being eaten, not all of it's being properly distributed. So what do we do about that? And so today's guest uh, is going to go into detail about his solution and his company's solution to that very big and difficult problem. So I would love if you could start off by introducing yourself, where you're from, and the work that you do. Yes. Uh, My name is Mayan Mahfoud. I am the founder and CEO of Replate. Um, I'm based in San Francisco, Bay Area, and uh, I'm super excited and thank you so much for hosting me today. Awesome. And if anyone has questions in the audience, please feel free to put them in the ask a question box or in the comment box um, if you have any questions for today's guest. And we'll get to them at the end of the episode. So to start us off, I want to know what first drew you and your attention to the food waste crisis. Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, for me, it was uh, food waste. I, I got through food waste through the lens of food insecurity. Um, I um, I immigrated to the U.S. Uh, about 11 years ago, and uh, and to be honest, I was sort of struck by the the amount of uh, people that are uh, unfortunately living uh, in the street, experiencing homelessness, um, and where you can see clearly um, is sort of the level of poverty that is that is happening, and. Uh, uh, and at one point, I, I found a person who was, uh, you know, looking in a in a trash can for a sandwich to eat, and that that for me um, was uh, an inflection point in a sense because like I came from the Middle East, specifically from Syria, to the U.S., uh, where I'm supposed to have the all the advanced technologies and all the wealth and the American dream, as you all know, of course. But uh, I was struck to see that level of. Um, um, people who are experiencing food insecurity. And to me, it just sort of took me back um, to uh, home uh, where uh, my mom used to always uh, cook for my brother and I a lot of delicious Syrian food. And, um, you know, and uh, she would not let us sit and have our lunch or dinner before my brother and I go on these bikes in the middle of the day, it was so hot. Um, And we had to go and deliver uh, some food to our struggling neighbors, uh, neighbors who are challenged by certain life circumstances and and we used to hate it um my brother is looking at shit we have to do this again and again and again but you know it sort of uh, grew on us and coming to the u.s that's the was one of the first things that i thought about i was like okay so why aren't we doing something similar here and uh one way was looking through you know my uh dining centers through my campus at, at that time and uh you know we have a lot of this buffet style food and and i was like okay why don't we just take that food and distribute it to uh, these encampments around the campus at that time at UC Berkeley. 
And uh, uh, that sort of, uh, th so through the lens of uh, food insecurity, I was like looking for solutions that are already available. Okay, so we have this food around us that we're throwing away. Why don't we just take it and distribute it to the right people? And giving I was in the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley, with the most advanced technologies at the time where you can get a, an on-demand cookie in 30 minutes, why can't you also do the same for your surplus food, the leftover food that you typically uh, you know, throw away that is so nutritious and so valuable? Why can't we do the same for that? Also, I totally didn't even know that you went to UC Berkeley. What? Yeah. How did I miss that detail? That's it's hilarious. All good. Um, <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. go, go Bears. Go, yep, Bears. go Bears. That's great. Um, that's so cool. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely being in the Bay Area, like there is so much food insecurity all around us, even despite, you know, having some of the highest living costs in the world. And yeah. yet we're seeing such disparities of people, you know, not even being able to eat, even students on campus, not even being able to afford food because they have to worry about, you know, their student loans, um, managing so many different jobs, having to pay for super expensive housing. I mean, yeah, students on campus, I remember there was, multiple articles talking about um, how students like weren't even able to eat like proper meals. And, you know, there was like food pantry and stuff on campus. But I mean, like, that's not enough to be able yeah. to feed people on a consistent basis. Totally. And to reiterate what you're saying, especially with COVID-19 right now, there's a lot of students that are dealing with this, whether in New York or in the Bay Area. Um, the, the whole economical challenges that we're facing are not allowing students to focus in class, right? And like, whether it's economical, whether it's social, whether it's mental, so providing food can be more than just, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm facing food insecurity, but also I want to focus on my class. I don't want to worry about rent. I don't want to worry about other expenses that come uh, on my way. Yeah, and I mean, like, you've already kind of touched on this, but I'm just wondering, like, there's a lot of people who might argue that, like, oh, it's the individual's fault on like why food is wasted or like we have plenty of cheap food available. So like, can people really be uh, food insecure or whatever? Um, but I'd love for you to debunk some of that on like, what is the consumer's role in the food waste crisis versus the suppliers or, you know, places where they would actually get food in the first place? Yeah, yeah. So I, I would start with the consumer in the beginning which is us going to these supermarkets and buying our own foods. And I just talk about how much uh, knowledge and, and awareness and education as well, that sort of comes with understanding what you're buying, right? Yeah. And uh, we're lucky nowadays that we have more companies that are actually exposing that so that they have that education aspect as part of their business model, which was not the case previously. So consumers now, whether they want it or not, they're almost like uh, forced into learning that through businesses. And that's something I'm excited about, given that, you know, if you, we just mentioned, you know, companies like Improv Produce or like uh, Pad Beats or a similar organization that are built on a business model that actually uh, uh, on, uh, that focuses on educating consumers uh, in terms of what they're trying to sell. So one, consumers need to be um, not only forced, but also proactively reach and understand what does it mean to buy something local versus buying from a, a chain restaurant, right? What does it mean that I am buying an Oreo cookie versus I'm buying something that is more nutritious? So I think there's a lot of that um, uh, education that need to happen, not only from businesses who are taking that, I feel like there's roles for the government and roles for schools to start picking up these tricks. I mean, if you wanna call them tricks, but I think they're positive from businesses who are teaching these, uh, uh, um, important uh, information about where you should buy and why you should buy that. Um, and then from a, um, from a grocer standpoint, right? It's a, it's a fine line, right? So you want to show abundance in your supermarket. Otherwise, um, uh, otherwise people will not be enticed to buy from, you, right? Like if you go to, for example, Whole Foods, right? If you go and you want to buy some produce, lemon, whatever, if you find the whole thing empty, not like, abundant and beautiful and plentiful right you're not going to be as enticed to buy it and but at the same time you don't want to produce so much that you're wasting it so there's definitely a fine line from a uh, uh from a from a grocer standpoint from a supplier standpoint and then also there's that um uh, uh that, that culture of like you know well this has just expired i think there's a lot to be worked around education where 
okay, so what does expiration date mean, hmm. right? Like if we uh, uh, just, I don't know if you know, Dana Gunders uh, from Refed once said something about, well, if you, um, you know, if you go and buy a milk that sort of expired by one day or best used by yeah. a certain day, well, the milk doesn't know that. So the, the, the um, <laughs> You know what I mean? The milk doesn't know this, and it's actually <laughs> still fine. To, the, the 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 food is still fine to consume, right? Oh, so I think yeah. there's a lot of work to be to be done around expiration dates. That's and true. Best Buy doesn't mean that you cannot eat it. Uh, it's just maybe the flavor is less intense or it's diluted a little bit, but it's still consumable and still has some nutrition in it. So I think there's that uh, as well, and there's packaging, yeah. right? There's how do you package your food, and how can you package it in a way that does not encourage more consumption. Uh, there's a lot to be done, but honestly, I'm very hopeful um, and optimistic in terms of seeing all these businesses that cannot ignore anymore uh, educating customers about why is their product better than the other. And it's encouraging competition to create better products that are better for the environment um, and better for the people. So uh, I just want to end it with this sort of hopeful note, right? Because end of the day, businesses um, want to sell, right? But they can't sell if people are not convinced. So they're going to have to look into their, um, yeah. and the way they do things. And it's a fine line, like we mentioned, in terms of how can you show you have a lot, but at the same time, not not too much that you're actually contributing to the problem. Yeah, exactly. No, I think I think that's a really great point. I think if companies are going to want to show that they're innovative and that they're actually going to address this problem, then they like can't contribute to it also. I think, I mean, that's really straightforward. And, you know, for people who might not understand, like food waste is like a very big contributor towards the climate crisis. Um, you know, it's one of the things listed by Project Drawdown. Like it's, it's definitely something that is contributing to global greenhouse gas emissions. Yes, it's and, about 10% of the global greenhouse um, emissions. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think for people listening, like this is not some small thing. And, you know, I know growing up, it was always like, don't waste your food because this would be, you know, this would feed someone else in some other country or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's like <laughs> people even in America are not even getting food, apparently. Such a good point. So I think it is one of those things where we have to also understand that, yes, one thing, like in principle, we should only be consuming what we can within our means like we should not be buying excess things like we should be thinking about you know am i going to actually eat this thing or am i going to just eat takeout for the week instead of just throwing out everything but exactly. there's also but there's also just the fact of the matter that there's grocery stores that are you know throwing out perfectly good produce and food just because it has a bruise or just because you know it has the bet the you know best buy date and people yeah. are like, oh, like these are broken goods now when like maybe they had a way longer shelf life. So there is a lot of misinformation. And I think and it is important that suppliers are also taking responsibility for that. Totally. And there's also that culture of liability that I think is a little bit more uh, more American. You know, like there's that <laughs> people are always, you know, worried like, yeah, oh, true. I'm going to get sued. I am, I'm going to be held liable. I'm so worried about that. And I think that in a bit also contribute to the to the issue, right? Like you're saying yeah. there's these grocers throwing away perfectly good. They're just worried, right? Like what if yeah. I give you this person got sick? Or like and, and but there's knowledge of certain, you know, rules or laws around yeah. you know, Good Samaritan Act and Bill Emerson where it actually protects food donors from any liability and things like that. So there's there's hmm. that culture. And I think you really uh, hit the nail on the head with the idea of you said, you know. We always heard of food waste in a sense of like, well, someone is starving in a certain place, right? Why are you wasting your food? But it's way beyond that, like you mentioned, right? We're all sharing <laughs> yeah. this climate. We all share this atmosphere, right? And yeah. when we, and there's this connection that we found also at Recreate that people, not a lot of people knew about that, you know, when you throw away your trash and it goes to landfill, mm -hmm. then that it emits gases like greenhouse gases, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, methane, these mm -hmm. gases contribute to climate change. So there's a clear link between throwing away your food rather than eating it and climate change. So I think this is such a good point. Yeah. yeah. And a nerdy fun fact, just building <laughs> off of that, people are always like, yeah, if I throw my food away, isn't just going to turn into compost? Well, yeah, the yeah. fact <laughs> is, is that actually when your food ends up in a landfill, it gets buried over. So basically imagine like, your banana peels, your fruit, whatever, is getting like suffocated. And then all of these 
um, methane producing microbes start like eating it and then it releases all this methane gas. Whereas compost is like it, the, the waste is getting a lot of oxygen and water and is exposed to the environment. And so less of those methane producing microbes are present in a compost pile instead of a landfill. So just a fun fact that no, if your food yeah. just is thrown away, it is not, it will return to the environment, but it's also gonna contribute to greenhouse gases as well. Exactly, so. and and instead maybe like, you know, invest some energy and figure out how to do, donate it first so that other people or animals can consume it, right? If you look at the hierarchy, you know, you're supposed to first, you know, try to donate it and then try to do animal feed and then composting from, mm. from an efficiency standpoint. I never thought about the animal feed thing. That's a really good point too. Yeah, um, so composting is not always a solution. That's what I'm trying to say. Try to figure out like what could be done even before that. I'm like, animals don't care about bruised apples. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're not yeah. gonna complain about that. They're not gonna <laughs> throw it away in the trash. Um, anyway, this is great. Uh, so just building off of that, in your opinion, how does rebuilding the food supply chain intersect with the fight for climate justice? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. You know, climate justice has been, you know, out there for a while, especially because of COVID-19. I think sort of the pandemic definitely exacerbated and sort of revealed and exposed these challenges that we have in terms of climate justice and uh, racism. And I think that's such a good point. And what you can call it anything, you know, climate justice, uh, you know, uh, or anything else. But the idea really is if you're a supplier of food and you want to create as much food as possible, you want to mass produce, you know, you're in America, don't forget that. You want to mass produce everything. You want to make it so cheap. You want to make a lot of it, right? There's an expense for that, right? Like you're going to scar that ecosystem, whatever you're growing, whatever you're building, whatever you're creating, right? You have to always think of something, but you can't just make so much uh, for so little, right? And the challenge with that, like think about it right now, we're seeing a lot of it, the fires, uh, the floods, uh, the extreme temperatures. Um, I mean, you saw what happened in Texas very recently too. So I think looking at these examples in front of our eyes and seeing, okay, these are because of certain practices that um, these suppliers are doing in terms of cutting costs, creating so much, creating abundance, which is beautiful. Again, so getting back to the idea of having an abundance and surplus and plentiful of things, but at the same time, there's consequences, right? You can't just create that. So the consequences is basically these crises, the climate change and the challenges that happen. But the problem is people will say, well, okay, but we're all part of this and we are you know, part of the same crisis, but that's not true. There are certain populations that are getting hit way harder than others. It's disproportionate. Uh, who are these communities? Low income communities, uh, people of color, people of certain communities. And so it's not fair. Now you gotta think about what climate justice is. Well. If I'm a business, I'm trying to, you know, reduce the price of a certain item. It doesn't mean that I'm doing a great job without thinking long term. What are the consequences? And even as a business, if you think about it right now, and we, we also mentioned how businesses are already thinking about this stuff more recently, because it's also from an economical standpoint, it's actually cheaper. Like, let's say these businesses, okay, we're going to cut the price of this energy bar. Instead of $10, we're going to make it $5. Okay, well, short term, yes, you, you will make some money. But if you think about it long term, where is this energy bar sourcing its uh, fruit, its coffee beans? It's uh, uh, who is delivering them? These are the people who are really affected by making it cheap. So what I'm trying to say here that these businesses, if they're thinking long term, they're smart and they're thinking long term actually by being more sustainable, and thinking about your carbon footprint, you're potentially saving in the future. So it's a win-win-win for everyone. But I wow. think it's just that greed and short-term thinking that would get us into that sort of climate justice situation. Yeah, I love that reframe. Like it's so solutions oriented and so refreshing because especially, you know, in a lot of spaces that I'm in when talking about these crises, you know, this is exactly why I have this show is to think about solutions and i love that that is you know your ethos and what you focus on and that you know it's focused on cheerleading businesses to do better instead of just being like you suck so yeah. i i think that's it's great a, it's a positive attitude totally it's whether it's a business whether it's a person that culture of shaming is not the way yeah. to go currently and we're Definitely all seeing not. that yeah Definitely not. i think if people have the opportunity to realize that um 
you know, in rebuilding these structures and, and reframing it, like everyone gets to win um, and, and we are able to balance things out. I think people could realize that that is a part of the fight for climate justice. And I think that that's a really awesome point that you brought up. And building off of that, I know that you kind of talked about at the beginning with just like what got you invested in this work, but uh, I would love for you to talk a bit more about your background. Uh, you have a background in health and science, and I want to know like how did that inform your work on Replate? Uh, yeah. Because I know there's people in the audience who probably would love to learn from you and are probably inspired by the work that you're yeah. doing. So would love for you to share like how um, you know, your academic background allowed you to do the work you're doing now. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I, uh, my background is I did a molecular and cell biology when I was at UC Berkeley. And uh, it's basically teaching you how to be a scientist in a sense, right? It's very micro level, like what is happening in the ribosomes in the cells, right? Which is amazing because I think if you get trained as a scientist, it's great because you start believing more in data and evidence, right? Because there's that line between business, marketing, and then there's these like, scientists in the lab right where where i think uh, scientists care so much about data care about like correlations and causations and and versus you have business and marketing well we got to do this in 100 days i don't know how or where or what's the so i think there's that fine by so what i what i learned at least in my um my years when i was trained as a scientist is that uh always seek data always seek evidence um, and not just be pulled with whatever you see out there, right? Not everything's there. Take everything with a grain of salt um, and make sure you, you collect enough evidence to do so, right? I also did my um, master's in public health uh, in, in London. And uh, in, in that program, I, I learned how to take that sort of, you know, scientific methods in terms of getting data um, and uh, uh, analyzing data at a micro level into macro level, right? Like it's a public health, it's global health innovation. So now we're talking about population health rather than talking about like a certain cell and what's happening at it, right? So I think from there, you learn also similar stuff, right? Like, um, you know, evidence is important. You have to collect multiple, you have to read multiple research papers. You can't just read one headline in a magazine and then, or on, on some, you know, platform and say, okay, yeah, that's why the reason is, right? So you have to really dig in deeper collect multiple you know papers about a certain method for my for my graduate school my thesis was about reverse innovation so um uh, basically i i was investigating why you know in the west we don't use enough uh research like papers from the east or from the developing world right so if you look at most of the research paper they collect it all together something called meta meta analysis um where basically they take all the research findings and then they come up with an average of what would that be, right? If you look at that, uh, a lot of the publication that come from uh, low income countries or developing countries, they don't get included for some reason. They don't match certain criteria. In fact, there's a lot of learning that we can actually get from these developing countries, but we don't include it there. So that was my, so again, I brought this up uh, for a reason that there are biases, right, in the, and how we perceive data and research and evidence. And we can't just settle for what's available and easy to access. There's a lot of knowledge that we can learn from, uh, from other uh, uh, countries, from other communities in, in, in our sense as well, like these fires that are happening, right? And the whole term reverse innovation is already inherently biased if you think about it. Why are we calling it reverse innovation? So does that mean innovation should come always from the West? Just to think about this stuff, right? But anyway, going back to your question, um, I think public health and I also did some medicine uh, and um, I think the, the main two items that I really carried out with me is one, um, understand data, don't be tricked by the first thing you read, um, value other opinions who are like, you know, countries and communities who are not similar necessarily and they yeah. are considered developing, right? And empathy for these communities, right? Whether it's through medicine or public health or others, be empathetic. And these are values you can take anywhere you go, whether you start a company, uh, whether you start a research lab, whatever it is, these are values that is core to our work at Replate. Um, and core to me as a person, yes, I love academia. I love the science. I love the stuff, but also it's not enough. So you see what I mean? Business is also important while it's maybe less 
data driven and evidence driven, you need business solution interventions. You can't just theorize all day, right? You got to exactly. create solutions. You got to create intervention that scales that can choose things, uh, change things in real life. So this yeah. is sort of like where 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 I stand in terms of kind of education and sort of work standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I love what you said about just like that. A lot of these solutions are framed in a Western lens, and I think you know, even looking at the work that you do with Replate, which we'll get into in a second. Um, you know, I think it's more rooted in this idea of repurposing and being resourceful, which are very inherently like, in my exactly. opinion, yeah. things you find growing up, like as a person of color or like, you know, as, you know, someone like in my, you know, in my family growing up, um, like it was like, you had to make do with what you had, you had to make resources stretch as far as you could. And, you know, I would say that in itself was abundant. And I think that you bringing up um, that point, like, I feel like the ethos behind replay is kind of rooted in some of those principles. It's not very much like, let's just max out profit, not care about where our waste goes, um, not maximize what we can do with that to be resourceful. It's like the opposite. It's like, let's take what we have and make sure that it lasts for the longest amount of time as possible to benefit, um, you know, as many people as possible. And I think that that, um, yeah, it's really interesting to hear your thought process because it probably, you know, laid the foundations for a lot of what you're doing now. Totally. Um, it is It is a combination of all these experiences that you come yeah. to. It's never like, okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. It's really a combination of experiences, <laughs> yeah. a combination of uh, values, uh, thoughts, uh, ideas, actions that you've done that really sort of adds up in a certain way. That's so true. Yeah. So, yeah. Can you explain uh, what Replay does <laughs> to yeah. the audience? Just like, yeah. what is the business model? How, what, it, what is y'all's approach to addressing this issue? Yeah, so um, Replate, uh, basically Replate is a tech nonprofit. It's a 501c3. And we are a B2B platform, meaning that we work with um, businesses, uh, what we call food donors. These businesses range from your uh, chain restaurant like Chipotle, Sweet Green, uh, or uh, Dig In, for example, in New York, or it could be campuses like UC Berkeley, we work with UCSF, dining centers at these campuses or hospitals. Uh, we work with um, also a lot of businesses and offices like, you know, your Netflix campus or like, uh, you know, Amazon warehouses or Imperfect Produce as a grocery, grocery outlet, uh, Whole Foods in, uh, in Castro. So anyway, these are some clients who we consider food donors who subscribe or sign up to our, to our platform. And then we also work with um, um, uh, recipient organizations or what we call the beneficiaries. And these are typically nonprofits that can take the food and distribute it. And they range. They're not only just your typical soup kitchen. Uh, so they're also, uh, you know, shelters, youth programs, uh, senior centers, citizen, citizen assistance programs, any nonprofit that is working on a certain mission that can use our food to enhance its mission. So we're working with the lower dogs as well, like, you know, smaller nonprofits that are certain places that would like food, right? So uh, what we do as a platform, we basically match both. Uh, we not any match, we find the best match. And then we also take care of the logistics. So for example, uh, let's say Whole Foods in Castro just requested a pickup for their prepared foods. And let's say it's like 50 pounds. They will sign up, they will uh, uh, request an on-demand, they can request an on-demand pickup for that, or they can request um, uh, a weekly uh, recurrent pickup, let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So they will schedule that and then one of our drivers got get nudged and then they basically head to the location. They're all food, all our food rescuers are uh, not volunteers. They're uh, hired, trained, independent contractors though. Um, and uh, we, uh, we typically uh, pay certain um, fee for their toll, for their parking. And they basically get there, they uh, uh, take the food. If it's packaged perfect, if not, they package it, they weigh it, they put the data in terms of what it was. And then they deliver it to the uh, best match uh, shelter or soup kitchen or a nonprofit that can take it. And as a full cycle, these businesses, they have a, a, a dashboard where they can see live their impact, right? Impact data. And we can talk more about that 
um, later, but you know, they get social and environmental metrics, uh, sustainability reports, so that they can engage their stakeholders. Of course, they can use it for a PR, corporate social responsibility, whatever that can be done for, to, for them to enhance their brand and reduce their carbon footprint. That is so cool. I love it. I think yeah. that that's such an innovative idea. And I especially love that you all pay the people that transport everything. I think that's really important because, you know, I've heard a lot of different programs that are kind of similar, but not quite like that. And it's only like volunteer run. Um, yeah. So that's really cool that you've been able to figure out how to like make sure you uh, support the work of the people yeah. moving there things. Are there are a lot of amazing food recovery organizations in the country, but I, I think what makes Replate a little bit different is, first of all, we are a nonprofit, but we have a real robust technology and we have a team of engineers and data scientists. We have an earned revenue model, which is a lot of nonprofits typically, uh, you know, uh, uh, depend on our philanthropic revenue uh, from grants and individual donors and et cetera. But like we, we, we have a very strong and robust earned revenue model where there's a fee for that service. So these businesses, when they request a pickup from us, they pay a fee for that one pickup or subscribe for a monthly fee. That's so awesome. I think that earned revenue makes it different. Our technology is very smooth, very seamless. So it's like very easy to request a pickup, just like you're getting an Uber or like, you know, reserving an Airbnb kind of. There's a lot of that learning from the That's other cool. for-profit companies that are around us, right? How can we take that and adopt as much as we can? Uh, we're very data-driven. We provide all these metrics. Um, for our donors, for our stakeholders, uh, and for the businesses, for them to actually, uh, you know, uh, get the right, uh, you know, uh, whether it's tax incentives or uh, engage their stakeholders. And then finally, the thing that makes Replate very special uh, is that we do take the extra mile for our recipients. Um, so we do meet people at, you know, where they are. So if we, for example, have a recipient, smaller recipients, let's say called Project Rosso in New York, that is far you know, from our way, for example. And there's a big one like uh, what's considered the glide here, there, there's like um, uh, other organizations that are larger. So how can we make sure that we also fail and we can actually take that extra mile for the recipients? Mm -hmm. And uh, especially the smaller ones who don't necessarily have food in their programming. So, hey, like come, we'll teach you how to get a job or we'll teach you, we'll train you how to get a job, but we're also gonna give you food so you can come and actually get trained. Mm. that kind of mm -hmm. that kind of relationship that we develop with our recipients and beneficiaries no that's really cool i i i think that being able to have uh that kind of business model allows you a lot of flexibility to ask for what you need as an organization to thrive to be able to like make your business model sustainable over time so i i think that's really really brilliant I wanted to know, building off of that, how do you measure Replate's environmental and social impact? I know that you were talking about these metrics, but how exactly do you measure that? Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, we measure it. So for environmental metrics, uh, we we take uh, pounds of food, like how many pounds of food we uh, recovered or rescued uh, at a certain pickup or a certain location. Uh, we also... Uh, uh, look at how many, so that sort of convert to a certain number of meals, right? Like how many meals uh, did you create for this community, right? So you can convert between poundage uh, rescue to meals created. And then from an environmental standpoint, um, you take um, uh, you take a sort of uh, the conversion from pounds of food to a CO2 diverted from the atmosphere, right? Because there's, if you basically keep the food from going to landfill, what is, um, what is the reduction in the CO2 or methane or greenhouse gas emission that you're creating and how much uh, water you save from the food system because we're saving water too, right? We're not like getting rid of the food. So these are the environmental ones. We also measure other things like how many jobs we created, right? With this, uh, of course, it's not a full-time job. It's a contract to do our spotty donations. And then there's also what is now what we're working on. We actually did already the demographics. So when the recipient signs up, um, they can input in their setting, like who are the demography to what percentage are the LGBTQ uh, or what like sort of like, um, is this like seniors? Who are these population that is benefiting from the, from the food? And uh, we also are integrating some um, API in our platform so that we can get more nutritional benefit of each pickup so that we're not just donating, you know, uh, chips or cookies, you know, what's the nutritional value of that Spanish chicken that we just delivered? 
um, uh, or that salad that we just rescued, right? So that will show how much nutrition is being transferred as well. Yeah, I, I, I think that's great. I, I wanted to know, just building off of that, like what do you feel Replay is doing to address things like food deserts and food insecurity, especially for uh, you know Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities? How do you feel like your company is really yeah. helping out those populations? Yeah, I, I think I think big part of that is uh, in terms of how we select our beneficiaries, right? These recipient organizations, like I mentioned previously, like we try to do it as broad as we can, right? Like uh, we don't try to exclude other organizations because they're smaller or they're out of the way. So it's not always like, uh, and then also include other organizations not they're not have food in their programming, like I mentioned. And then the other one is like. Replate is building a matching algorithm uh, for a while, and they were in, a, in an iteration number two. When I say matching algorithm, meaning like a technology that allow a certain donation to be matched to the right driver with the right capacity volume, with the right um, um, vehicle to the right recipient that is open that can receive that kind of food for that amount, right? So this matching algorithm, unfortunately, you have while you build it, you have to think about what are the uh, inherent biases that can come with it. For example, if you're doing a matching uh, uh, algorithm based on a location, then how can usually, uh, you know, uh, most of our food rescuers are, you know, people of color, right? Yeah. And um, so how can you include them in these donation locations, even though they typically don't live close to these businesses, mm -hmm. right? So in a, some sense, it's counterintuitive, you know, it's inefficient to be... Uh, to be considered in the matching algorithm, right? So, so we, yeah. we have to think about that stuff. So we need to be uh -huh. able to include these people in the matching piece, right? So this is from a technology standpoint, we have these parameters in mind and we're willing to forgive that from an efficiency standpoint to actually be more inclusive. Uh, we're also, um, uh, for example, I can give you like, we recently got a request from a um, group of refugee, refugees that um, they were sort of like, arriving from like an ice detention center i think it was in, in arizona and they were like requesting meals right and while it's the mark our market in, in phoenix is not as strong however we try to accommodate the challenge even though it's not the most efficient and easy seem this way for us to do it so i think that that is that also speaks to sort of how we're trying to do that as much as possible and then as an organization, we have, uh, we're working on some sort of anti-racism goals. Um, you know, like one of the goals, for example, is when we work with our food rescuers is how can we give them badges um, uh, to, to make their entrance more seamless, uh, right? Uh, into these buildings. Like, um, yeah. for example, we have a pickup in, uh, uh, in the World Trade Center, right? Imagine like getting into the lobby and like you can get, you know, a lot of, comments are what are you doing here right like why are you in this lobby so we're trying to create mm. materials and, and uh, materials and documentation for our food rescuers so they can actually get uh, better treatment uh you know and for them to actually submit feedback to us through well i got this kind of treatment at this location how can we make their life easy so we're yeah. consistently working on that lastly i think um just to think about like uh, nonprofits in general. And I think there's also inherent biases in how nonprofits operate, right? And these are stuff we consistently working on. I'm not saying we figured it out, but it's also part of our anti-racism goals, which is, uh, you know, like if you have board members, they usually, they typically, they typically uh, recommend that, you know, you have board members who pay, right? In order to include them on board members, they have to donate and fund your organization. But the problem with that is then you're you're attracting certain board members that are usually wealthier than your average who can yeah. donate, right? Um, so then your board suffer from diversity because you know there are certain people, wealthy uh, board members that can come in because of that, but others you basically cannot join because they can donate. However, they can give you a lot of great thoughts and uh, direction about your organization. Yeah, There's that's like. That, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. I think, you know, moving forward, I think I love the idea of, of having them give you feedback. I think being able to have some sort of like advisory council or something for the food rescuers to, you know, have like, 
you know, also a big stake in the work that you're doing is also important since they're at the core of like your business model too. Um, exactly. So I exactly. think that'll be really cool to see um, how your organization is able to like make that more democratic because I know there's so many concerns with gig work and, you know, what rights those those folks have. So it's great that you're really aware of that and really taking yeah. action on it. It's really important. Yeah, and, and totally what you're saying. We're all learning, right? Like, and then there's the other aspect of inherent also in the nonprofit world. When you get a grant or secure a certain grant, they're very, especially strict grants. You get a lot of these strict yeah. grants where they don't allow you to spend money on personnel, right? Mm -hmm. Payroll or staff. You have to put it through the program. Right. And the, the, the problem with that is that then you end up as a nonprofit always like struggling because you can't pay people as much as they deserve to be paid. Yes. Right. 100%. Even though they're doing incredible work. Yeah. But the problem now with this is that then, well, you don't have a lot of uh, salary to offer uh, staff. Then you also end up attracting certain population that doesn't don't care as much about money. Yeah. That are yeah. solving problem for people of color. Yeah. You see what I mean? It's a I'm cycle. Just, no, that's a great point. It's a great point. You see point. what I mean? So you end up, end up with end up with cycles that are, Yeah. I hope they're not um, uh, built in uh, purposefully, uh, yeah. but it, whether they are or not, I think collectively, whether you're a funder or you are a nonprofit leader, I think you should try to stay away from unrestricted donation as much as possible. Yeah. Because I really don't think it helps anyone. And it also... Um, not only, you know, sort of um, push people of color away from this work because they cannot afford it, but also um, does not allow you to get the right talent to get and scale your work, which is more important than a lot of these on-demand cookie delivery companies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that. I love that. Um, so where is Replate located? Like how many locations do you all have? Or like, where are you based? Like, yeah, it feels so, so cool, yeah. Yeah, so Replate is uh, based in the Bay Area. Uh, Oakland, San Francisco is where our HQ is. But we do operate our, our biggest market, like I said, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, East Bay, of course, Oakland, all these regions. Uh, and then the second biggest market is New York. We're very big in New York as well. Uh, meaning Brooklyn, Manhattan mostly. Um, we also work uh, in uh, Texas, in Austin, uh, in, uh, and in Ohio, super emerging markets there in Columbus. Uh, many We do a lot of these um, DoorDash essential markets there, uh, pickups. And then we also have uh, pickups in LA um, and uh, Chicago as well. These are like the biggest markets where we consistently try to uh, sort of develop partnerships with other nonprofits uh, to also help with our expansions in certain markets. So yeah, I mean, what's the like five year, 10 year plan with this business? It seems like it's really growing and you know, it sounds like you have a lot of yeah. ideas on how to innovate it and make it stronger. So yeah, just from a standpoint of, you know, being in the nonprofit slash tech world, uh, where do you see uh, Replay growing? Yeah, it is a very interest, interesting uh, mix, you know, because like as a tech, you got to scale and grow and like, you know, and be everywhere. But at the same time, you're a nonprofit, like you're basically uh, be always struggling and you're trying to figure <laughs> out where your next funding is coming from. I mean, our own revenue is definitely being very helpful for us in terms of yeah, giving us okay. more, more of that stability and strength uh, to get engineers and get data scientists uh, who can who we can sustain. But I think... Um, uh, whatever it's called, right? Like we have five years and we have 10 years goal, but end of the day, like you can only plan so much. And like COVID-19, the pandemic, what happened really sort of taught us a lesson about, uh, okay, well, you have a plan to do X, Y, and Z, but now you got to switch gears. Uh, you have to be agile. You have to be flexible. Yeah. You have to you have to figure out what works and what not. Let me give you an example. Replate is not where we are right now. We're not... Uh, a solution for food waste or uh, food insecurity. We're just, we are basically a mediator until we figure it out, right? We are trying to develop awareness. We're trying to hold businesses accountable around yeah. their practices, right? So they can pay a fee and try to contribute to the, to the challenges, aware them and tell them the right information so they can try to reduce uh, consequences of their practices in general. Yeah. But I think uh, the real goal for Replate is to, 
try to fix that, right? Like we have organizations like Feeding America, for example, for 50 years uh, with thousands of food banks, they're not even making a dent in the food insecurity. In fact, we're actually getting an increase in that. So what I'm trying to bring in that example, bring home, these, these dinosaur nonprofits, while they're doing incredible work, they need to start thinking, what are they doing wrong? Yeah. They need to think about what they're doing wrong because they're clearly yeah. not solving the problem uh, and they can do way more and I'm not saying that in pointing fingers, but I do think that they should look at other nonprofit and tech companies that are doing incredible work and try to adopt and switch gears if necessary. If something's not working, stop growing it. You see what I mean? Call so it it's out. Important. I love yeah, that. Yeah. I'm gonna call it out. I think there are way better systems and technology that can not necessarily solve the problem. It's a systemic issue. We just talked about it. It's a, it's a poverty cycle. It's a bit, small businesses get out of business. That's where they end up in, yeah on the street and that's what really caused food insecurity, right? Yeah. It's not the amount of food or, or it's it's a whole systemic issue that needs to be addressed. Feeding America and other organizations like ours, as we grow, we should be thought leaders in the space and really drive policy yeah. that can actually lift people from poverty. If we really, if food insecurity is our biggest challenge because food waste yeah. is solvable. Food insecurity is a little bit challenged. Food waste, is you need to do certain practices, you do certain measures, create certain solutions. You can you can slash it in half, you can also reduce it so much. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to food insecurity, I think it's a, it's a very big challenge because it's systemic, it requires breaking the cycle of poverty. And I just told you about how many uh, inherent biases in our system, including nonprofits and charitable institutions. So it's yeah. like, it's it's not, I'm not saying it's impossible. I don't wanna be pessimistic when it comes to food insecurity, but I think there's a lot of organizations like us, hopefully within five years, we will you know, finish developing our matching algorithm, be in every metropolitan city in the US and beyond the US, potentially sell our software to uh, governments outside of the US, right? We yeah. would love to also collaborate with all these other food recovery organizations that are doing great work to expand our fleet, tap into each other resources, and in fact, we'll grow further and further that way, right? But oh, ultimately, yeah. ultimately, you want to become you want to be in a position where you are a thought leader who can potentially drive legislation that can actually make a difference instead of just uh building more food banks and uh buying more uh, vehicle, uh vans and vehicles to move food around so ultimately like the big vision if you could you know dream up your ideal food system to be addressing like food surplus and food yeah. insecurity it sounds to me like it would be one policy being addressed to like actually improve the practices around um, like how food is produced and distributed. Yeah, yeah. The, the infrastructure that I was mentioning, how yeah. do you have an efficient infrastructure to move food around, not more food banks? Yeah, um, yeah, because that's how it actually gets to people. It's not about like the actual location where it's stored. It's about like how do people actually reach and access it? Okay, yeah. Accessibility is the biggest point. And if technology, the on-demand technology uh, uh, is making that happen, then we should double down on that, right? Yeah. Why? While at the same time, we should not forget about the importance of driving policy that lifts people from poverty cycles. Like for when we provide food for these other organizations that help people to get jobs, right? Then we're actually powering that system. So you're not only creating an infrastructure to move things around most efficiently, that is very important, but this has to be accompanied by policy that actually strengthen these grassroots uh, nonprofit that are putting people back into work, mm. supporting small businesses, mm -hmm. um, because this is where you want to prevent this poverty cycle to happen. Yeah, that's a really great point. I think that people don't want to address that because they're just like, oh, we need to end world hunger. Or like, yeah. they, you know, they just talk about world hunger. It's like very empty statements, but it's like, do you actually know what that means? Do you know why that's happening? Um, and that like, yeah, if, if people were brought out of, you know, the poverty cycle, you know, if we were able to address wealth inequality in this country, um, you know, those are at the root of addressing food insecurity because there's reasons why certain communities don't have access to healthy um, or safe food. And, um, you know, meanwhile, we see metropolitan areas that uh, have grocers that are producing large amounts of food, but aren't properly addressing, 
you know, the waste that comes from that or the surplus that comes from that, that could be otherwise used. So um, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of different knobs that need to be turned. And ultimately it seems like um, organizations that have been doing this for a long time need to rethink their innovative strategies um, and their PR and their marketing to restaurants and businesses to be like, hey, we're here um, to be a bridge to make it easier for you. And it's great that Replate, you know, is such a thought leader on on shifting that. So as a thought leader, moving forward off of that, uh, what's your advice to people who maybe, you know, you know, they're living in their households or they just want to learn more about food waste? Like from your thought leader standpoint, like what are the things that you think they should read or learn or uh, become more acquainted with about this issue? Yeah, I think there's there's plenty uh, people can do without leaving their home. Um, I think one of them is just like be thoughtful about the food in your fridge. Uh, a lot of the waste happened because we're not necessarily, it happens last minute. We don't plan for it, right? Like, oh, okay, last minute, I had no idea. Like we have that much food in our fridge, right? Or we didn't think meal planning, right? Like what am I gonna cook? Okay, what am I gonna buy for what? Um, you know, if I want, um, you know, to, to get to eat out one day a week, can I bring food for four meals wow. or five meals? Uh, this week. So I think more planning, uh, be thoughtful about what's in your fridge um, and stop calling it waste, call it surplus. Yeah, it's uh, it's not waste. Waste is when you cannot utilize this thing, right? Mm. In fact, food has a lot of energy, a lot of nutrition, a lot of, um, it's it's everything. And I think when you call it waste, you really bring it down and you shouldn't down instead of actually encouraging people to uh, uh, use it and use its value and use its nutrition. Um, order less also, um, you know, uh, when you order, always be thoughtful. Okay, do I need all that, right? Um, how can I uh, buy from a, from a restaurant that is more conscious, right? Around um, uh, the amount of food that they sell or how they package it um, and how packaging also affect how much we consume as well, right? So always be thoughtful around that. One thing you can also do um, is uh, if you have food or you know of a restaurant or a chain restaurant or like any source of surplus you're aware of, research what are the food recovery organizations around you in that area. Uh, there's plenty everywhere. So do some research around who are the food rescue organization around you. Uh, and uh, reach out to Replate as well if you if you would like. And we can sort of help you with that research too or potentially start in that city you're in if you feel like there's a lot of demand there. Um, you know, events going to come back, uh, conferences going to come back, all that source of surplus is going to come back. So uh, just having that in mind, there are solutions out there that are trying to make make it better from a, from a food waste standpoint. And um, yeah, I think these are some small practices that could be done that doesn't necessarily require a lot of energy, but can add, add up at some point. Totally. I totally yeah. agree. And um, yeah, to people out there too, like clearly from what we talked about, it's also like uh, the onus is also a, a lot on suppliers who are trying to figure this out. And so I, I think being able to keep up with the work that Replate's doing, being able to support their work, um, you know, so that way, you know, not all of us can go uh, maybe target all these suppliers. That's a lot of uh, work. And, <laughs> lot you know, work, we yeah. might not know all, all of the, the logistics and the technical information. So I think an easy way is being able to support the work of Replay because they are the experts who literally have the relationships with those people. Um, so definitely check out Replay, support their work, follow them on social media. Um, how can people stay in touch and learn more about the work that you're doing? You can add on to what I just said. Yeah, yeah, of course. I also want to, before I do that, I want to also encourage community fridges. I've been, I'm a big fan. Uh, we, totally. we do work with a few um, in LA region, in other places, every, every community is adopting that. So if you have a community fridge, whenever you're traveling, whenever you have surplus in your fridge, you can always put it there. Uh, in terms of how you connect with us, um, replay to your meal, uh, you know, Twitter account, Instagram, uh, feel free to come to our website, replay.org and chat with our uh, amazing team. Uh, it's as simple as going there and chat with us. Uh, tell us what you think. Um, yeah, we would love to hear from you. Yeah, and I and I just want to add on to to what I think about food waste, but now renaming this term food surplus. It's just that, like, yeah, like when you're at home, like 
food waste is the one thing that out of all of the existential things to feel bad about related to climate change, it's like the one very tangible daily thing that you can totally. touch and address in your everyday life to reduce your emissions um, by starting a compost bin, um, by like, like was presented, like donating it to a food recovery organization, um, really figuring out like what you can do with that food, maybe even volunteering your time for one of those food recovery organizations. Um, anything helps. And I, I think it's the one thing that out of all of the solutions that I felt are in like your grasp as an individual to address the climate crisis, food waste is like the one thing that is so preventable, um, especially if you do have access to that food. That's a different conversation than if you're food insecure. But if you do have access to food and, you know, you're in a house and you have a fridge full of food, please be mindful and be responsible with it because it does have an impact in the long term. And um, yeah, so I I think this hour zoomed by, so we might not even do questions actually. I think I, I asked a lot of great questions. Um, but if you wanna know more about Replate, please visit their website, follow uh, them on social media, and you can always ask them follow-ups following this conversation there. And um, yeah, thank you so much for all your insights you. and the work that you're doing. It's it's really impressive. And, um, you. you know, I think food waste is such a food waste slash food surplus. I mean, I start doing it. It's such a big issue. And, um, you know, I'm excited to see where your business takes off in the next couple of years. And we'll have you back on the show as it Hopefully. progresses. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you right. so much. Thank you. And, you too. Yeah. And uh, for everyone listening, this is the Brown Girl Green Show. My name is Christy Drutman, and I interview environmental leaders and advocates about creative solutions to the climate crisis, as well as diversity and inclusion. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's show, and we'll catch you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye.